Well, good afternoon, and what an amazing day. It's been busy and lively at the museum all day long. Um, we were to open at 9, and we needed to open about 15 minutes early because we already had people lining up outside. I'm... <laughs> So really, really wonderful to welcome all of you today. I'm Patricia McDonald, um, director of the Art Museum. You know, when museums thrive, when we do well, it's because of amazing patrons and incredible members and a community of people that reaches out and comes together and is engaged and comes to Saturday, fun Saturdays like today. So thank you so much for being here. With that acknowledgement, um, please indulge me. There were quite a list of people who stepped forward to help us with the funding for this exhibition. Um, shows like this, I, I wish I could tell you that they come at no cost whatsoever, but that's not the case. Um, and some, some, it's an impressively long list of people who were um, so generous to help us. So the first, the lead sponsors for the George O'Keefe um, show are Paula and Barry Downing. The Latner Family Foundation and Judy Slauson provided additional major underwriting. Charles Baker and Dr. Dennis and Ann Ross are principal sponsors. The Trust Company of Kansas, Fred and Mary Koch Foundation, Celebrity Cruises, and Emprise Bank are substantial corporate and foundation sponsors. We also received support from Louise Barron, Donna Bunk, the Devorah Foundation, Eric Engstrom and Robert Bell, Mary Eves, Rich and Joey Giblin, Norma Griever, Sonia Gretemann and Chris Brunner, Gridley Family Foundation, John and Karen Hageman, Sa Sandra Langle, Mike and Dee Michaelis, Tom and Mindy Page, Will and Kristen Price, Debbie and Ron Sinclair, Mary Sue Smith, Sarah Smith and the KT Wiedemann Foundation. And yet, we also had um, sponsorship from museum patrons, including Anna Martin Bauer, Emily Bonavia, Dr. John and Nancy Bramer, Dr. Allen and Sharon Fury, Tony and Bud Gates, Trish Higgins, Rich, Richard Height and Anita Jones, Delmar and Mary Clucky, Dr. Barry and Jane Murphy, Georgia and Keith Stevens, Marnie Vleetstone and David Stone, and Sue and Kurt Watson. And that's not to forget our standard bears, both the Friends of the Wichita Art Museum and the City of Wichita fund um, all the exhibitions and therefore also the George and Keefe Show. So please help me in applause for such magnificent <laughs> really need to publicly um, extend the deepest thanks to the Wichita Art Museum staff. We do heroic efforts um, at this museum. They really pour themselves into the work and in particular the people who spent countless hours the past couple of weeks um, in the galleries with all, but also all the prep work to get them into the gallery so that's um, our curator, Dr. Tara Hedrick, who's at the back of the room. Kirk Eck, I saw floating around. Oh, he's right over here. <laughs> he's imaging and installation manager, and Tony Marshall is our preparator, and he was floating around here today, too. They, you know, if you've been in the galleries, it's an incredible show. And think of all the different um, important ways and all the details uh, that it takes to make an exhibition like that sing. Um, cycling to the star of the Wichita Art Museum, I'd say for the weekend, but really it's the entire spring, and that's Wanda Korn. Um, a woman that I've known for, we don't want to say how many decades at this point, and it becomes harder and harder for me to introduce Wanda for many different reasons, but in part because her list of accomplishments just keeps piling higher. Um, she's not a stranger to the Wichita Art Museum. She's been here a number of times in recent years. In 2014, she was the wooden lecture here, and she actually gave an early lecture as this exhibition was in development. So she's, she's not giving a, a specifically exhibition lecture this time. Um, it's, it, it's slightly different. Wanda is the Robert and Ruth Halperin Professor Emerita from Stanford University. 
She, her PhD is from New York University, and then she taught at Mills College for a decade, and then 30-ish years at Stanford University. In, in introducing her, I really need to collapse all her <laughs> accomplishments, and I'm just going to focus on two things. I'm going to look totally past the seven books that she's written. She's already uh, now working on her eighth. And I want to focus on her awards and, and her scholarship. So she um, is the recipient of the Distinguished Scholar Award in 2014 from the College Art Association. I, you know, m most of these that I'm about to name, and I'm, I'm not naming all of them, are Lifetime Achievement Awards. And to be named the St Distinguished um, Scholar by CAA, which is the Learned Society for the Visual Arts, is really quite something. It means you're a rock star. Um, she had received from the same professional association their Distinguished Teaching of Art History Award in 2007. Um, she received uh, the Charles Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Arts from the Smithsonian. Um, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Visual Arts in 2007 from the Women's Caucus for Art, and she received the Lawrence Fleischmann Award for Scholarly Excellence in the Field of American Art History in 2006 from the Archives of American Art. I'd say, you know, it's really almost her fair share of Lifetime Achievement Awards at this point, but I'm sure there are, you know, there are professional associations out there still wondering when, when to um, recognize her. She's She's revered appropriately for many different reasons, but she's a scholar scholar, and by that I uh, reflect that the range of her interests, um, of the things that she thinks about and, and writes about, both the depth and the subtlety that she pursues her project is uh, why we think of her as a scholar scholar. Her major projects, so exhibitions and, and books include, um, she's worked on um, Andrew Wyeth, Grant Wood, Gertrude Stein, um, American Tonalism, the Women's Building and the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. When the professional journal, the Art Bulletin, which is really the weighty journal for uh, art history, when they wanted someone to review, assess, and critique the status of American art history at that point, to whom did they turn? Wanda Corn, of course. After roughly two decades of dedicated research, she uh, brought forth just an incredible uh, book that was a landmark achievement, The Great American Thing, Modern Art and National Identity. And it won one of the most coveted prizes um, in our history overall. The Smithsonian American Art Museum awarded it and Wanda the Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art. And because the world is small, Charles Eldridge is a premier scholar at the University of Kansas, and he has joined us at the back of the auditorium today. So you can bump into Charlie at the end of the lecture, and he's joined by David Cataforis, who's the other significant American art historian at the University of Kansas. So Wanda has just touched so many lives, as you can gather from this list of um, places that she's gone and things that she's done and uh, incredible topics and artists that she's written about. And we're about to hear her share some of her wisdom about George O'Keefe. Please help me to welcome Wanda back to Wichita as well as to the podium. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Patricia, for that um, fulsome uh, introduction. And I, my thanks also to the staff. She's already shared them, their names with you, but uh, it's been wonderful to work with the curator and the <coughs> installation team here. This is not an easy exhibition. It's multimedia, 3D and 2D. Um, it's uh, everything from clothes to photographs to paintings that are hung in ensembles, not as separate genres. Uh, and you should know that your museum here has done a fabulous job that competes with the rest of the exhibition venues uh, where this show has been. And my lecture today is going to draw upon the O'Keeffe um, exhibition upstairs, uh, which if you've been there, you'll know it looks like the pictures on the uh, right. Um, but I wanted to say that 
It's had uh, two titles, as it turns out. One is the original title, Georgia O'Keeffe Living Modern, which was the name given to it by uh, me and the Brooklyn Museum, which premiered the show. But over a couple of venues, art, image, and style came to be one of the preferred titles. I actually like it very much, and so did Patricia and, and Tara, who were working with the exhibition here. So we have title number two that is in play um, at your museum. Um, as you know, it is made up as a, of paintings, sculpture, photographs, but most notably the fresh sort of element is the garments drawn from uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's wardrobe. Indeed, it was my discovery of what she left behind in her closets that stimulated the fresh perspectives that the exhibition brings to the artist. The dominant one being the aesthetic unity of her art and her sartorial style. Another revelation of this show is its demonstration of how carefully she self-fashioned herself when she modeled for photographers, as she did so often. And that is the thread that I want to talk to you about today. I want to concentrate on O'Keeffe and the ways she dressed and posed for photographers. It's a little known fact, and I haven't got this um, statistically down pat, but I believe she is the most photographed female artist of the 20th um, century. So let me begin with an image that was on Life Magazine's cover in 1968. A solitary woman, woman wrapped in black, her gray hair in a bun, her bowed face profiled against an adobe chimney on a new Mexican rooftop in an empty desert. Her swaddled body is contained. She's drawn into herself, not engaged with the photographer nor the camera, nor us. Maybe she is meditating. How do you and I know that this is Georgia O'Keeffe? Not just because it says so in small print under her image, but because we as 21st century viewers recognize this visual vocabulary. For those of us who keep track of major figures in the arts, we have seen so many times before in our newspapers, our magazines, our books, this berobed body, the averted eyes, the inward gaze, the adobe setting, and the open skies. Even the choice of words that the media use to describe O'Keefe on the cover reinforces this notion of her as something of a Zen mystic. The caption, stark visions of a pioneer painter. The word pioneer conjures up the idea of her as an early practitioner of modernism, but also as someone identified with those who came by covered wagon and stagecoach to settle in the open and arid spaces of the American West. The words stark visions allude to her as something like a saint or a mystic. This vocabulary that, vo that uh, people were using, Life Magazine was using, is also one, it's a visual vocabulary, and it extends and secularizes the old master iconography of Christian saints, such as Giovanni Bellini's famous Saint Francis on the upper left. Uh, seeking con of, of St. Francis seeking contact with his God out in the countryside, or image drawn from Eastern religions of Buddhas or monks in meditation, or nuns in the black and white habits. And, of course, Mother Teresa of <laughs> Calcutta comes to mind as another contemporary figure whose covered head and sun-dried skin has notable similarities to O'Keeffe's scarfed head, black dresses, and distant gaze. And that's, of course, the lower right. What I want to explore today is how the application of this loose religious and saintly vocabulary uh, to Georgia O'Keeffe became so firmly rooted in the American imagination. How did St. Georgia of the desert become her public persona? <laughs> Now, what do we mean by persona? It's a word we banty around a great deal these days. If we look in the dictionary, we find that persona is, in fact, a word that was only started to be used in the early 20th century. And it meant and means mask or public face. 
A persona, in other words, is not a fleshed out three-dimensional portrait of a complicated individual, but it's visual shorthand that has come to stand for someone. Personas are created when a stock image is repeated in modern culture. That repetition is usually photographic and in the media. When someone is given that same pose, that same look, repeatedly, and that becomes her persona, or we might say today, her trademark or her brand. Film stars in American culture, for example, often evolve into personae. Marilyn Monroe with her mane of blonde hair and her parted juicy lips, or Marlon Brando as a tough working class dude. O'Keeffe's persona was that of a solitary figure wrapped in black, drawn into herself and away from society. So what I want to do is two things. First, I want to explore how photographers, beginning with Alfred Stieglitz, her partner, invented a visual vocabulary that at first had quite a bit of diversity to it, but eventually narrowed itself down to become the St. Georgia persona. Secondly, I want to look at the artist's agency in the industry of persona building, most particularly in the ways she dressed for photographers and how she posed. It was she who chose what she was going to wear when she was going to be a model for a portrait session and convinced photographers to picture her with a closed mouth and a serious mien rather than a smile or parted lips. This story of how O'Keeffe partnered with portraitists, we will see, is a fascinating one. When I began looking at O'Keeffe's wardrobe and was trying to figure out what she was wearing when, I looked to photographs of O'Keeffe to help me understand her taste and to date her garments. One of the first things I noticed was that there was far more variety in her closets than what we see in photographs. That pictures of her assert a consistent black, less is more aesthetic. Born into a late Victorian household, I learned, she never conformed to her mother's conventions of dress. She was a rebel dresser well before she became a radical painter. As the critic Barbara Rose rightly put it, quote, Barbara, uh, excuse me, O'Keeffe appears to have been born modern. Simplicity was always her natural idiom, reticence and directness her normal means of expression, end quote. Over the course of her long life, and she lived till 98, she was 98, O'Keeffe honed a predominantly black and white wardrobe and wore outfits that emphasized unbroken silhouettes. From childhood on, she always opted for plainness over ornamentation. She also insisted that her garments be comfortable and functional, so she gravitated to robes, capes, and wraps that were easy for her to slip into without any assistance. She liked pockets to carry her hankies and was drawn to elemental shapes, round mother of pearl buttons, V necklines, or mandarin collars. To use art vocabulary, she dressed as if she were an unbroken black and white abstraction moving through space. I call this O'Keeffe's amazing continuity. And in doing that, I'm co-opting that nice title uh, from a title that Stuart Davis, an abstract painter, used for one of his um, works. And I want to give you one telling early example of how she exerted her independence rather than conform to the dress codes of her peers. On the right, um, is not, she is on the left, but on the right, you see the, what you might call, I might call for you the mainstream look for middle and upper class teenage girls when they dressed up for special occasions, such as having their photographers done. And I believe they're either sisters or twins, I'm not quite sure what, but it's just such a beautiful photograph and it, it helps me make this point that when you got ready for the photographer uh, and you were in high school, you wore a white dress, with long sleeves, lacy bodices. And commonly, you brushed your hair up into a high pompadour around the face with an oversized black bow at the bottom of your pigtail. And that's what you see here. These great big things are not hair, but these are great big flouncy black bows. In comparison, O'Keefe on the left wears a similar white blouse or dress, but is in a plainer version. 
and she has spent no time whatsoever puffing up her hair <laughs> and adding a bow. This became her lifelong pattern. She begins with fashion, that's au courant, but she then whittles it down to suit her abiding minimalist taste. As she put it once in reminiscing, from the time I was a little girl, if my sisters wore their hair braided, I wouldn't wear mine braided. If they wore ribbons, I would not wear any. This independence of dress and lack of traditional femininities continually engendered commentary. And one can only imagine what her mother must have thought. <laughs> uh, she never left behind any words. But O'Keeffe's high school yearbook left behind words describing her this way. A girl who would be different in habit, dress, and style. Habit, style, and dress. A girl who doesn't give a cent for men and boys still less. <laughs> I'm going to quote from a first person recollection of O'Keefe in high school that helped me recover some of these early habits of dress, especially her rejection of ornamentation. And this quote comes from, again, a, a, a memoir statement by a classmate of Georgia O'Keeffe's um, who went to Chatham Hall. This is where she graduated from high school um, in Virginia. Uh, and this is a sorority photograph from her high school senior year. And one of her sorority uh, members vividly remembers when she first walked into the study hall at Chatham. Uh, and she'd been there for a week or two and also I think had been a student the prior year. And O'Keefe was a newbie uh, coming in. And when, this person said, she saw her, quote, I felt perfectly competent to criticize this latecomer especially as she was unusual looking. The most unusual thing about her was the absolute plainness of her attire. She wore a tan coat suit, short, severe, and loose, into this room filled with girls with small waists and tight-fitting dresses bedecked in ruffles and bows. Pompadours and ribbons vied with each other in size and elaborateness. But Georgia's hair was drawn smoothly back from her broad, prominent forehead, and she had no bow on her head at all, only a tiny one at the bottom of her pigtail to keep it from unplatting. Nearly every girl in that study hall planned right then and there how they were going to dress Georgia up. <laughs> but each plan came to naught. For this strong-minded girl knew what suited her and would not be changed, though she approved of other girls dressing in frills and furbelows. I realize now that Georgia knew her style and type. The features you, she's discussing, the memoirist, that you can see here in this sorority photograph. If you just note, she is the third one down. I've sort of given you, um, I'm giving this away to you. But just look who has the tightest sleeves of every single one of those white dresses. Just try to find who it was that doesn't have one of these sort of big birds hanging on the bottom of their pigtail. Who is it that has their hair pulled the most severely back with a part even that shows as if to make fun almost of these girls that are all similarly uh, with their hair piled up. As Miss O'Keefe said once in getting back at probably thinking of what she was thought of at the time, the girls there all thought I was pretty strange, but I thought they were pretty strange. <laughs> She continued this trait of dressing simply and differently for her entire life. And whenever you see a, 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 a picture of her in a group, it's especially uh, rewarding uh, to see how she's dressed versus everybody else. So here she is here in her plain black dress with a brooch, and, and you can see the kind of costuming that other people, they're all getting an award of one sort or another. I note that some of them are wearing corsages. I don't think she would have been caught dead with a corsage, but uh, in any case, they don't all seem to have corsages. But you, you get my point, that whenever she was photographed in a group, she registered plainness and non conformity. In her mid-twenties, O'Keefe made her living as an art teacher uh, in Texas. 
and had transitioned from student clothing to adult garb, wearing plain, undecorated outfits with, black fla with flat shoes and thick stockings. I've been able to determine that she was primarily making her own clothes during this period, and she was a, sub uh, a superb seamstress with an excellent eye for fabrics, insisting upon only the most refined cotton, silks, and wools that she could find. In small town Texas, where she taught, her clothes, just like in high school, continued to be the subject of gossip. Oh, she wore black, wrote one woman, black, black, and black. And her clothing was all like men's clothing, straight lines. She didn't believe in lace or ruffles or things like that, end quote. What got tongues wagging was the public association of O'Keeffe's way of dressing, not only with male dress, but also suffrage, feminism, and advocacy for dress reform, female dress reform. O'Keeffe was a, as they were called at the time, a new woman. Um, influence we know by feminist reform writers such as Charlotte Perkin Gilm Perkins Gilman's, whose writings O'Keeffe read and commended to others. She was comfortable with her radical dress and could easily flirt, as she does here on the right, and be a bit sassy when posing for the camera. You can even see that she knows how to smile. <laughs> this is how she was dressing when she met Alfred Stieglitz for the first time. A meeting, and this is she in his photograph of her on the left, and himself by another photographer, Paul Strand, on the right. This is how she was dressing when she met Stieglitz for the first time, a meeting that became probably the most important biographical event in her early life. Stieglitz was a photographer, a gallerist, an activist on behalf of two big causes. Photography as an art medium and modern art, especially American modern art. And his galleries, if you're in the world of art history, you know, were called things like 291 for 291 Fifth Avenue, Intimate Gallery, and an American Place. He was very influential as a public figure in New York, and he used his galleries to kickstart careers and promote those artists he believed in. There was just a handful of them, but he was fully on their side uh, and helped their careers get launched. He was introduced to O'Keeffe's work while she was teaching in Texas, her early watercolors and abstractions, and he found it impressive. He is said to have said, Finally, a woman on paper. He showed some of her pieces in a group exhibition at his gallery 291, and he began a correspondence with her. When they met in 1917, Stieglitz had installed a one-woman show of her early work. He asked to take what's all she had. <laughs> early work, but that's it. Uh, I just noticed my own uh, uh, looking back here. Um, he asked to take her photograph, and he made a double, um, about a half dozen images, like the one you have on the left. Um, they began to fall in love, and in 1918, the following year, he issued her an invitation. Quit teaching. Come to New York City to paint full time and pursue a career as an artist. And he offered her modest housing. You have to know that she was teaching because she, did, she needed to make a living. Her family had fallen on hard times, uh, and she was using her art skills in one of the very few ways you could use them. She had gone to art school for a couple of years, and that was to be uh, a teacher of art, first in high schools, and then she even ran a small art department in a new teacher's college um, in Canyon, um, Texas. All right, so Stieglitz makes her this offer. She accepts, she leaves her teaching position in Texas, and takes up residence in Manhattan. Stieglitz, who was married at the time, unhappily so, well, had one daughter, um, very quickly thereafter leaves his wife and moves in with Georgia O'Keeffe. That's in 1918. Uh, he finally is able to get a divorce in 1924, so they, they live in a very progressive relationship <laughs> until that time, uh, because then he's able to marry, um, and they live together until his death in 1946. He was 60 when they married, and she was 37. There were 23 years of difference between them. A very important part of their relationship was the epic photographic portrait that he made of her. For 20 years, and many of the most beautiful of them are upstairs for you to look at, for 20 years, from 1917 to 1937, she posed and he framed and shot her through his view camera, making 
All in all, over the 20 years, some 330 portraits of her, most of them very formal works, not snapshots. His black, her black and white wardrobe played well to his black and white film. He called the project a continuous portrait. And in the first year, two years alone, he did a hundred studies of her, many of them in the nude. We won't look at those today because I'm into clothes for this particular lecture. <laughs> but uh, uh, you may know some of those nude uh, uh, works. And they faded away, partially because she began to realize they weren't doing her reputation any good. Um, uh, and so, uh, and, and also, uh, just for their own relationship, it was better that that, uh, uh, that particular way of presenting herself uh, uh, change. Stieglitz then not only launched her career as a painter by showing her work in his galleries and getting critics to write about it, but he also, and this is an important point, he created face and body recognition in New York and for art people who were following what he was doing in his galleries, he created face and body recognition for his young wife by showing his photographs of her, his pieces of his continuous uh, portrait in exhibitions of his work. So let's look at a few of those images. Um, uh, and I'm coming back. This is, these are his images, but these are his images um, of, of other of his artists. Um, and I wanted you to see, to see them because what's interesting about them is that he often used this as a kind of staging ground, and that is to have one of his artists stand in front of one of their works um, of art. Uh, and then he would direct them to look at the camera or look up or, or, or whatever. But what's unusual about his early portraits of O'Keeffe, which are in this particular mode, is the way that he inserted her head into her works of art. And this is very different from the way he posed male artists. Stieglitz took many portraits of the artists in his circle when they visited his galleries, each against an artwork behind them. When he posed male artists in front of the works, they became, the works became murky backgrounds. And the same was true when Steichen posed him in front of uh, his own photographs um, in 1915. But when Stieglitz photographed O'Keeffe in his gallery, he had her body interact with the painting behind her. Her collar in the portrait to the left, for example, right here, if you look how that continues the lines of that abstraction uh, so that it becomes the bottom edge uh, of the painting, the V of her dress growing into the shapes in her art. In the photograph to the right, he asked her to raise her arms, being come one, come, becoming one with her painting, her, tree, her free flowing hair extending the work below the frame as do her raised arms with its two round patches of body hair. In other words, he engaged a different body vocabulary for a female artist than the ones he used for the men in his circle. And this conformed to his deeply held beliefs that men and women had very different ways of making art. Finally, a woman on paper. That uh, it was, is reflected in that statement. Stieglitz's highly gendered gaze has been thoroughly studied. So let me just summarize it by saying that when he posed O'Keefe in front of the camera and decided how to crop her body, he rather intentionally and I would say respectfully essentialized her as a woman. He presented her not just as a modern artist, but as a modern female artist. And he did this when he talked about and marketed her art to others. For instance, not only the finally a woman on paper, but when he described her in print at one point in 1919, he said, women feel the world differently than men feel it. The woman receives the world through her womb. That is the seat of her deepest feeling. Mind comes second. Stieglitz came up with a typology of poses for O'Keeffe that all feminize her, some more obviously than others. Uh, eventually, uh, she narrowed this diversity, but at the beginning, uh, he tried out a variety of poses um, so that he could find the vocabulary that he wanted for a woman artist. 
For instance, it was very commonplace in the early 20th century to think that women were closely allied to nature. They were rounded, they were organic, they were flesh-like flowers and fruits. So many Stieglitz photographs of O'Keeffe aligned her with nature, caressing trees, holding apples, grapes, leaves, and emphasizing serpentine flowing lines over straight angles. Also, when she self-consciously dressed mannishly, and that was a word that was popularly used in the 20s, acting out her commitment to new womanhood and radical sexual politics, he drama dramatized her dedication to non-conforming modern dress. Progressive new women like O'Keefe enjoyed borrowing from male attire and dressing androgynously. They were gender benders, we might say, naughty women experimenting with a unisex look. And Stieglitz liked to, uh, and perfected this really, shoot her from below when she dressed this way, creating her as an abstract shape against the sky. She's wearing his cape, he was a cape wearer, in one, and a v-neck black sweater in another. She and Stieglitz were both partial to capes, uh, a garment associated with artists since the mid-19th century, particularly with artists like the Pre-Raphaelites in England, or Whistler and Oscar Wilde. O'Keeffe and Stieglitz used capes in a similar way. They presented themselves as they wore them to the outside world. They were artists, and they broadcast their differences with bourgeois culture. But they also used black capes to smooth out the irregular lines of the human body and loosely align themselves with the look of ecclesiastical robes. So we've given you a little bit of woman artist, nature artist, modern woman. There's one more definition of female O'Keeffe that Stieglitz invented. Let's call this the mysterious or spiritual or mystic O'Keeffe. In this variation, he more explicitly evoked religious dress, such as the ecclesiastical habits with hoods worn by nuns and monks, or the covered heads of churchgoers. Most likely at his direction, O'Keefe covered her head in a shawl or hood and looked away from the camera and focused inward, lost in her own thoughts and ruminations. Having her disengaged from the world around her, Stieglitz renders O'Keefe mysterious and unfathomable, not in communication with us, but folk, um, not with us, but with forces outside of ordinary society. Much like the work still photography did in creating movie stars, Stieglitz's portraits promoted O'Keefe's dramatic profile, her inexplicable gestures, and her black and white wardrobe um, the very same years he was introducing New Yorkers to her audacious modern art. One consequence was that when art critics wrote reviews of O'Keeffe's exhibitions, they felt free to comment upon her unusual looks and dress. For instance, in 1924, a female critic who had known O'Keeffe earlier when she had been a student reviewed her art and then said, what a different O'Keeffe she has become. She's no longer curly-haired and boyish, but an ascetic, almost saintly appearing woman with a dead white skin, fine, delicate features, and black hair severely drawn back from her forehead. Saintly, yes, but not nun-like. I don't understand that last statement, but I quote it to be honest. <laughs> uh, Stieglitz would have, and, and then I should just add that when Stieglitz would be asked, or when O'Keeffe was asked, to sit for another photographer for a magazine article that was going to be about her, and excuse my Xerox copies here, but to make this point, this is the best I could do, um, uh, instead of having the staff photographer come by, as other people did to do portraits like this of, of women, um, Stieglitz would say, I'll give you the picture. I'll be the PR agent in this case. You'll use one of my photographs of O'Keeffe. So you can see how she comes out looking very different from her artistic mates that are on the same page. Stieglitz would have liked that description I just gave you as, of O'Keeffe as saintly. And he surely approved of this Arnold Newman photograph of him and O'Keeffe that makes the two of them seem so monastic. Stieglitz was a talker and he regularly used religious rhetoric to describe the role of artists in modern society. He liked to call artists names like evangelists, spiritual leaders, even priests who had a calling to be society's saviors. 
Artists' missions in his mind were to create modern art that was so uplifting and beautiful that it would cleanse modern culture of its oppressive materialism. Arnold Newman, the photographer here, knew well Stieglitz's biblical talk, everybody did, and brilliantly set up his composition to communicate Stieglitz's self-defined image as a missionary, and he posed O'Keeffe, much like she appeared in Stieglitz's spiritual woman photographs, withdrawn and contemplative. Newman photographed them united in one wrapped black body, as if sp uh, spiritual brethren in an artistic order. Both appear grave. Stieglitz holds a book as if a cleric might hold a Bible. It was, in fact, a book about himself called America and Alfred Stieglitz. <laughs> she sits behind him, anchoring the unit and keeping her own counsel. Well, you can see where I'm going. By 1944, when this work was done and Stieglitz would just uh, live for two more years, some of the ingredients of St. Georgia the Mystic, the Zen Buddha, are already in play, but without one essential piece of the puzzle, reference to place. When Stieglitz photographed O'Keeffe, he generally generalizes the background. That's, uh, he generalizes the background, or he blurs it, or he just makes it a tree or a sky. So we really don't know exactly where uh, she has been photographed. And this kind of what you might, might call placelessness universalizes her as a woman of the world, to use, or to use his language, to her womanness. It would be the next generation of photographers who associated O'Keeffe's body with the American desert. For that part of the story, we need to turn to O'Keeffe's deep affection for New Mexico and to the subtle changes she made in her wardrobe when she went to this new place. And we have to turn to photographers who took over from Stieglitz after he hung up his camera in the late 1930s. He had a virtual monopoly, as you, and the exhibition tells this story very well, I think, over her image for about 20 years. And he never went with her to New Mexico. So if there was going to be a New Mexico chapter in this continuous portrait that he made of her, others were going to have to step in to do the job. And that begins in 1924, when she begins to spend summers in northern New Mexico without Stieglitz, who stayed behind where they had commonly gone for the summers, uh, to his family uh, compound, summer compound, at Lake George, New York. <laughs> After Stieglitz's death in 46, O'Keeffe cleaned up his complicated estate and moved to New Mexico for good, where she lived post Stieglitz for another 40 years until her own death in 1986. Over time, she bought two properties, the earliest and the smaller of the two at Ghost Ranch, and that's what you see here on the right. That's a painting of this home. This is the home. You're in the courtyard of it. Um, and uh, this is the home from the outside looking in the other direction with the famous mountain called the Pedernal that she painted so very, very often and that she sometimes called the mountain in her backyard and you can see why in that um, image. So that was her first, she sometimes referred to this as her summer cottage. And eventually she, and when she moved there for good, um, had acquired an, uh, a piece of property with an old hacienda foundation on it and created a much larger home and grounds in a nearby village some 15 miles from Ghost Ranch, Abiquiu, this much larger property, which afforded her the opportunity to have gardens um, and orchard trees, uh, to grow flowers and to become quite a professional, uh, or I should say sort of a su sustainable gardener uh, because she liked to do make uh, garden enough so that she could have her own vegetables to eat all summer um, long. When she began to go to New Mexico, she had become an experienced model. And in New York, she was a very well-known model because of what Stieglitz had done with his portrait of her. She had learned by then how well her minimalist black and white clothing translated in black and white film. And she never warmed to color film, which is why there's so little color in the exhibition upstairs. In fact, she asked photographers to only photograph her in black and white. She learned how to be comfortable striking dramatic poses with the tutelage that she uh, went through under Stieglitz. She'd learned not to smile or show her teeth when being photographed. 
And most importantly, she had figured out which photographic poses of Stieglitz she liked best. She did not like the ones that overly feminized her. Uh, she didn't want any more pictures of her in the nude. Uh, and she uh, did like those that made her appear serious, thoughtful, and expressive. She had a preference, in other words, for poses of the mystic and the spiritual type. She had also learned that photographs circulating through exhibitions and the media had become powerful tools for projecting her artistic identity, for creating a persona. Very few, if any of her contemporaries, had this kind of PR support in building their careers. With 20 years of experience, she now entered into what I would describe as artistic partnerships with a younger generation of cameramen who, as soon as Stieglitz stopped making photographs, contacted her and traveled to the west, southwest to photograph her. She continued to dress in black and white, but she began to add new accessories, such as long white scarves and wide brim black gaucho or vaquero. They're not really American cowboy hats, but more like the felt cowboy hats that the um, artists in Mexico and, and Central and, uh, America wore, as she's wearing here. That's probably the same hat. I thought at first she had many hats, but if you look at how beat up that hat up in, is in the <laughs> exhibition, I'm now come to think, and, the, and she starts wearing, you'll see some more beat up hats. The hat gets beat up and she never stops wearing it, so I've come to think she may have had one of these hats and wore it. Uh, for, the, for most of her adult um, life. So she's wearing them here for Philip Halsman, who was a New York fashion and society photographer, and he'd come to Ghost Ranch in 1948. Building on what Stieglitz had begun, O'Keefe easily fell into unsmiling poses. And the photographer, instead of posing her as an abstract mass against the sky, portrayed her seated in her own adobe courtyard with her collections of bleached bones and river-smoothed rocks. Indeed, Halsman's portraits play up both the strangeness and the beauty of a New Yorker, because she was still living in New York now, like O'Keefe, dressed in her black suit, who's chosen to trade in skyscrapers and neon lights for adobe red cliffs and collections of desert artifacts. He gives O'Keefe a brand new context, a specific indigenous landscape and architecture. After Halsman came others who helped to reinvent O'Keefe as a regionalized mystic. George Daniel in 1952 or Josef Karsch in 56 posed her as serious and sphinx-like, just as Stieglitz had, but geographically rooting her as he had never done. They viewed her here as a kind of strange priestess or a meditative nun, surrounded by things that were commonly understood as signifiers of the American desert. She was no longer, as Stieglitz had rendered her, a universal woman, but an artist of the American West. In a rare composition in color photography, taking one of her easels um, and a completed painting out of doors, Tony Vaccaro, the photographer, drew a relationship between her art, her arid landscape, and her wrapped body. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something about the wrapped body, the black dress, in just a second. But I might tell you a cute story that Tony Vaccaro's 95 or 96 right now, and he still remembers what, what turned out to be a week-long shoot uh, of O'Keefe, partially because she wouldn't let him shoot for the first three or four days because she had wanted him, the magazine he was working for to go get pictures from uh, the photographers I just showed you, Yosef Karsh and Halsman and so on. And she didn't like uh, photographing for brand new people it's, whose reputations she didn't know anything about. So I asked him how, and, and really this is the photograph he needed to get because this is what the magazine wanted, a colored picture of the uh, female artist in front of her art. That was his, his mission. Um, and when he finally got it, he got it in color. And I said to him, well, how did you do that? Because she didn't like color photography. And he said, well, by then we had kind of become buddies. I had made spaghetti for her, vaquero, he's an Italian. I had gardened for her, I'd pulled weeds, I'd picked the lettuce, and I had become okay in her eyes. So he said, when I finally suggested we take an easel out of sight, because he wasn't getting the picture he was sent to take, he was taking other pictures, but not this one, um, uh, she, she had warmed to him and, and said okay. 
but he wore several cameras over his neck, and he just said he would pick, take one, take a picture, and then say, mm, not quite right, and pick up another camera, and she, of course, wasn't conscious, her back was to him, for starters, uh, of exactly which camera he was using, and little did she know, but one of them, maybe more than one of them, was loaded with color film, because that was also part of his mission, to get a color picture, not a black and, black and white. So thus, this, this very famous um, um, photograph. Uh, but I want to tell you something about the little black dress that she donned for the very first time for Vaquero, because it became her go-to outfit for the next 25 years of posing. This is a commission of 1960. She wore these wrap dresses until her death in 86. Her adoption of it as a uniform underlines the degree to which O'Keeffe was not a passive sitter, but a strong-willed partner in the making of the persona that the media constructed. She exerted her agency in multiple ways. This garment was a little different from the black suits she had been posing in regularly. And these are two more Tony Vaccaro photographs. Uh, it was basically a cotton wrapper with a very wide skirt that she gathered together with a belt. It had a lot of material in it and was something like a cinched kimono, except it had narrow sleeves and a shorter hemline. It had no fasteners, no buttons, nor a zipper, and it was very plain. Uh, she simply had to put it on like a coat, wrap it around her, belt the dress with a favorite Mexican uh, uh, accessory by Hector Aguiar, and often she wore an, her Alexander Calder pin um, at the V neck, uh, the V, sh uh, the bottom of the V um, at her neckline. And she accessorized her head with a variety of Western styled hats and scarves. Well, to tell you just a bit more, because this was one of the great stories that I felt I had to crack in making this uh, uh, exhibition and, and writing the book, because I know of something like 26 wrapped dresses that were in her closets. So clearly this was a very important costume for her. And I was able, with the help of a research assistant, to discover that it was called at the time a popover dress or a pyramid dress. And it was um, not at all Diane von Furstenberg's wrap dresses of the 1970s. Um, but rather, it was the invention of, of a designer called Claire McCardle. And uh, it was so popular that Simplicity put out a pattern uh, for the dress in 1951. Um, O'Keeffe, we know, purchased her first ones from Neiman Marcus. Her versions were a little simpler than McCardle's. Um, McCardle's were, tended to be lined, and they had matching um, uh, belts. Uh, and the ones she bought from Neiman Marcus, and this, in fact, I believe the pink one up there is a Neiman Marcus, uh, were unlined, very simple, co nice cottons and nice um, colors. And once she decided that this suited her, uh, she then figured out a way, and if you go back, you can see, oh, maybe it's the next one. Uh, she, um, uh, she had a pattern for, made for one of these, and she could just take it to a seamstress, and I talked to two seamstresses who made her wrap dresses, and order them up in what other color or fabrics um, uh, she, she wanted. The black ones are, ones are the ones that she usually wore for photographers, but we do know from what was left in the closet and what you see upstairs that she also had several um, in colors. She liked the black dress, because it was comfortable, or the wrap dress, because it was comfortable and it had pockets, it shared features with robes and kimonos, and she could easily slip into it. It looked and felt right in the warm weather of New Mexico. And I'll just tell you that that simplicity pattern, when it's made, looks just like this. <laughs> and, and for those of you who know sewing, we bought seven yards to make this. It's cut on the bias. There's a lot of cloth. I feel like a little uh, 1950s, like I should have a starched slip under this, if I'm remembering back to the days of the 1950s. In any case, my research assistant made this dress for me, and we made one for herself as well, which is very fun. So as she aged, let's go back to as O'Keefe aged, she suffered from uh, macular degeneration. Uh, but he and here she is wearing her wrap dresses, um, and or in one case, she actually donned a 
kimono. Kimonos were what she wore in the house, not out of doors, but we have one single formal for portrait of her in the kimono, and you see that upstairs that's done by uh, Bruce um, Weber. But anyway, here she is in her wrap dress and, or the kimono, falling into that solemn pose which had become commonplace. What had started in Stieglitz's photographs and gone Western with Halsman and Karsh became a standard grammar for those making portraits of the artist in her late life. So to return to the Life magazine cover with which I began this talk, when I asked John Lonegard, still live, the magazine photographer who made this image for Life, what it was like to work with O'Keeffe, he told me she needed no coaching. O'Keeffe, he said, took this St. Georgia pose instinctively like a pro. He added that it was she who suggested climbing the ladder on the roof where she took her canonical position against an adobe chimney. <laughs> Personae, as I said at the beginning of my talk, never reveal the whole person. They are not three-dimensional beings who get and have bad hair days or can laugh and cry. Rather, they move around in American culture in a packaged look, a guise, a formula that stands in for the person. Pop artists like David Bradley, a Santa Fean uh, Native American artist represented here, knew this about celebrities. And he made a number of portraits, like the one here, treating O'Keeffe's persona with humor and irony and admiration. In his own pop way, he grasped that her art, her black wrap dress, her withdrawal into nature, and her engagement with place were the basic ingredients of her St. Georgia of the Desert persona. Some of Bradley's humor resides in his self-conscious replay <laughs> of another celebrity image, that of Whistler's mother of his stoic uh, mom wearing black widow weeds and seated alone in her surrounds for eternity. And it's also witty to imagine the artist as stiff and nun-like working alone in a stylized desert, a kind of westernized Mother Teresa. Though O'Keeffe was still alive when Bradley painted his image, O'Keeffe didn't pose for him, nor did she need to. He could easily draw upon the huge image bank the artist had spawned over half a century. But she did pose for this late life image by George Mobley, a staff photographer for National Geographic, who captured what you might call the uber thesis of my book and exhibition. And that is that O'Keeffe had but one aesthetic that she projected not only in her paintings, but also in her dress her homes, and her sessions with professional photographers. In this wonderful late portrait, the colors and strong outlines of the artist's profile and her clothed body repeat those in the painting that she, of a place she called the Black Place to the right. Even the way O'Keeffe angles her cane anchors the gray zigzagging ravine that cuts down the middle of the painting. There's such perfection here in visualizing a symbiosis between O'Keeffe's body and her painting that I asked George Mobley, now retired and living in Panama, how he got the shot and where did he find such an uncluttered wall. <laughs> he, he wrote me that he was on assignment taking shots for a National Geographic book on the American Southwest. He was assigned to photograph O'Keeffe and she had agreed to have him visit her at Ghost Ranch. They had coffee together, Mobley told me, and as they spoke, he was impressed by the stark graphics of the view in her living room, meaning the minimalist walls without much on them. He said, he simply told her, I'll pan she said, where would you like to photograph me? And he said, sit there, um, and I quickly took a few photographs. That was all there was to it. He was not there long, but long enough to sense the connective tissue between her painting, her dress, and her minimally decorated home. The photograph, he continued, won a prize in a national press photographer's contest, but he never saw the artist again. O'Keeffe played a role in arranging her face and body for Mobley's camera by dressing starkly and then easily falling into poses where she looks away from the camera and suppresses any hint of a smile. She learned those lessons first from Stieglitz, and then she made them her lifelong protocols. 
O'Keefe had vehemently disliked Stieglitz's essentializing of her as a woman artist and the way that he gendered her. But she liked being calibrated as a serious artist whose missions wa mission was to live in her mind, work hard, and bring beauty and poetry uh, into a difficult world. So one thing I hope you take away from my talk tonight, as well as the exhibition upstairs, is that O'Keefe exerted agency in the making of her image bank and the construction of her meditative persona, her Zen self. I would even go so far to say that painting was her most important art form, but modeling for the camera was another. And I would add self-fashioning to her skill set. When photographers came to call, O'Keefe was as deliberative, a deliberative, a modern composer of her body as she was a modern painter on canvas. By studying her clothes, and then portraits of her wearing those clothes, as we do in this exhibition, I hope I have expanded her expressiveness as an artist. In every aspect of her life, Georgia O'Keeffe lived, dressed, and painted modern. Thank you very much. Thank you.